So without further ado, I'm uh, just pleased to introduce Kara Miller. She's the Innovation Hub, WGBH reporter, host, forward-thinking broadcaster who has the privilege to not only sit at the front line of innovation, but talk and engage all of you. Kara? Thank you. As uh, David said, um, I'm Kara Miller, the host of uh, Innovation Hub from WGBH and Public Radio International. And what we're going to talk about in this panel is solutions that affect your everyday life. And a lot of these issues, hurdles, come out of both small and big tech companies. You know, so the technology that's being created right now, you know, you go out of here and go onto the T at Kendall, you'll see everybody hitting away on their smartphones. That is both the problem for many people who uh, are visually impaired or blind, and it is also potentially the solution. So you have this kind of double-edged sword and double-edged power that technology companies, both large and small, have. And the question is, what direction are we going in? Um, what we do know is what direction we're going in numerically. So we've got about five and a half million, which many of you know, about five and a half million seniors right now who are visually impaired or blind. 2050, we're going towards 16 million. So these are, these are numbers where you're going from a market that feels a lot more niche to companies to a market that is much, much bigger and clearly needs to be addressed um, in a way that's not happening right now. So the question is, what's happening? What's coming down the pike? We've got a fantastic panel, uh, Boal Zuberi, Suman Kanagati, and Eric Manser. And uh, I'm going to start with Boal, who's a partner at Lux Capital, which is an early stage venture capital firm. So he's always looking for new technologies, trying to see what's out there. And I'm just going to ask you sort of this big question, um, which I sort of framed in the introduction, which is, when you look out there at new technologies, do you feel like the uh, weight is more on the technologies that are going to be harder for people who are blind and visually impaired to deal with, or the weight is more on technologies that start to provide the solutions for people who think, well, how am I going to deal with this app and this app and this app? This is mostly for sighted people. But I think the answer to your question is, is actually a very simple one. And which is that I think um, perhaps not consciously, but certainly the technology trends are moving towards um, a direction where people of various sorts of disabilities, and especially, I think, um, you know, people who are blind or visually impaired um, would actually benefit from that. And I say that because if you take all the steps back, and I could give you a whole host of technology trends that I see in Silicon Valley that people are investing in. In fact, they're so excited about it uh, that they're, call it, they're calling it uh, the future technologies or the frontier tech. So if you want to talk to a VC and use the lingo that they use, you know, like they use the big data or the mobile web, the next one is to call it frontier tech. And the frontier tech technologies are things that are in the future, sort of coming in three to five years that people are imagining the technology insiders know, but the general public still doesn't until it just hits them in the face. The thing that's driving all of that, whether it's wearable devices, connected devices, distributed sensors, autonomous cars, autonomous drones for deliveries, uh, mobile bots and AI and natural language processing, and you know, I can go on and on with the jargon. But the important thing is they're all addressing simple things, which is automating our life. You know, they want to automate things so we don't have to do things ourselves. Now, if you think about it, obviously for somebody who may not be blind, this is to save time, add efficiency in our work process, how much of our time we spend thinking about silly stuff, even people who, uh, who may not have to deal with other, as earlier was said, broken environments. Uh, but we think about what do we want to order for food? What direction do we want to take? Do we want to drive at a certain time to you know, hit, avoid, miss the traffic, so on and so forth? Technology trends are going towards essentially automating all of those solutions for us. Our home lights, we don't have to get up and touch a button to turn our lights on and off. They lock automatically, right? Things like, you know, autonomous cars. You'll just call a car with the voice UI. You will basically say, Siri or Echo, get me an Uber. And a car shows up. You get into the car. You speak out your address you want to go to. And it just takes you there like magic. 
You, you don't even have to know which direction the car is going. Uh, it just takes you there. So all of those trends, and there's a lot of technology stack behind it that enables that. But all of that is, you know, in my opinion, addressing the kinds of problems uh, or the kinds of solutions that are needed for a vast majority of our population, including the blind population. I want to ask you one follow-up on that. You mentioned um, Siri and Echo, which are commonly used popular technologies and and you uh, said at one point you know whether it's by design or not right that, that it helps people um, who are visually impaired whether by design or not is there a cognizance that this is a very large growing segment or is it just like accidentally things that are being created for completely different reasons happen to have this helpful knock-on effect for people who aren't able to see that well or at all yeah, so, um, so the way technology develops is you have various layers of the stack, so to say, that get developed. People who develop the semiconductor processing chips, the next generation GPUs, and other base technologies, they're not thinking far ahead of the solutions that they will get used for. Then comes the second layer is device makers. The device makers start integrating all of these things. They still don't know what it will be used for, or maybe they have one use case in mind, but that's good enough to build a device that hundreds of millions of people could potentially use. And on top of it, you start uh, seeing entrepreneurs come up with interesting vertical solutions. By vertical, I mean interesting solutions in specific markets that could not have been imagined if those devices were not there, if these underlying components were not there. A simple example I'd give you is, you know, iPhone came out in 2007 iPhone would not have been possible if those touch interface screens that we now use ubiquitously were not, were not there. And this was, there's a lot of technology behind that to enable us to use a finger accurately enough and do the pinch, click, zoom, all that stuff, tons of patents around it. But when iPhone came around, everybody was looking for that little stencil that they were used to with the Palm Pilots. They're like, where's that little pencil that I can use to do my Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint? This is supposed to be an uh, efficiency, business efficiency device, right? Well. That's what people in 2007 thought this would be used for. What happened is entrepreneurs came on top of and started building apps. And who would have imagined in 2007, even Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or whoever you want to, you want your idol is, would not have imagined that the most interesting, the most valuable company created on top of the iPhone is going to be one to call cabs. Right? It's a $60 billion company called Uber, which is really all it's doing is automating the ability for you to get Uber, like I did this morning, to come here. The second most interesting company on top of the iPhone is for photos that disappear. Right? Nobody would have imagined that. Right? So all these Google Glass, just to give you an example, and I know, you know Suman will talk about it, Google Glass type camera systems were invented so we could do more selfies and photos and sort of the Snapchat young generation. Who would have thought that somebody like Suman will come along and say, hey, here's a device and here's a solution that's available that I will build something specifically for the blind population. So I think the application layer is where amazing things happen, enabled by all the hardware software systems. What we need is for entrepreneurs to, who, are, who care about particular sectors of the economy to understand and know what these trends are that are coming. So they're the forefront of building solutions for that particular population. Great. Um, that's a great segue to Suman. Um, uh, Sugman is uh, the founder uh, and CEO of Ira, um, which is an emerging company based in San Diego that is really focusing on the segment of, um, oh, of folks who are uh, visually impaired and blind. And, and just talk a little bit about, you have a really interesting uh, crossover here because very small company, startup, and yet you're building in some ways on the technology of, I mean, it's hard to get much bigger uh, than Google, and you're using in some ways their technology as well. So talk a little bit about your journey and how you got where you are. What Bilal said is absolutely true. Basically, all the technologies that he just gave you guys is what we implement. Um, you know, one thing, I don't have like too much experience in the blind industry, but two years ago when I started working with my friend Matt Brock, uh, who is legally blind, he lives in Denver, Colorado, he, he's actually my mentor who helps me with my uh, speech. Um, you know, so he, when he talks about blindness, it's all about, Suman, I'm not challenged with blindness, I'm not challenged with the vision loss, but uh, what I'm challenged with is with access to the information. Um, so, I mean, we didn't have this idea. The, you know, Kara asked, like, how did this all start? 
uh, we often talk on the phone because he helps me with my communication, as I mentioned. And uh, one day we decided, hey, you know what, there is this uh, Google Glass platform that exists out there. And there is it's a tiny little camera that is sitting right in front of your eye. So let's do a Google Hangout. So I said, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. So when we did the Google Hangout, now on my computer, I would see whatever he sees from the first person point of view camera. Well, it 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 was a mind-blowing thing because now I started describing the things in front of him rather than just talking to him on the phone. Uh, and then he said, you know what, Saman, can I, can I tether with this, uh, with a phone? I would like to take a walk. I was like, yeah, sure, let's try it out. So, you know, I pulled together a few people and, and uh, did some experimentation. I flew to Denver and had him walk around his own neighborhood and he started gathering some information which some of it he knows and some of it he is like, huh, you know what, this sounds very interesting. And soon enough. So let me just yeah. let me just clarify for people who have not used Google Glass or may have just seen it. So he's walking around his mm -hmm. neighborhood, mm -hmm. can't see. Blind. He's a, he's fully blind, right? Yeah, I should have mentioned that okay. he's totally blind. Yep. He's totally blind, but you're talking to him, and you can see there's a camera in his eyeglasses. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying like that guy's mowing his lawn, and like, did you know they're repaving that driveway? And he doesn't know these things necessarily. Yep. Okay. Yep. So I, know, one, I just wanted to make sure people <laughs> had the visual of like what's happening. But you're somewhere else in a different city, right? Yeah, we are somewhere okay. else in a different city. Um, so thank you. Um, so I mean, camera is one thing, um, and and we basically started pulling together a platform which you know essentially augments this information and puts together on the dashboard. So. You know, Hugh heard um, earlier, he was talking about the augmentation when it comes down to the bionic arms and, and you know, all the cool stuff. With information, it's the same thing. You know, earlier we talk, also talked about how many apps do we have. We have like millions and millions of apps. So one thing I learned, even in the blind and visually impaired industry, is there are millions of apps out there. You know, you have an app for color recognition. You have an app for reading text. You have an app for reading your dollar bills. You have an app for something else. You have an app for Uber. Now, it is all still point solutions, but how do uh, a blind person who is walking down, going to the home, wants to stop by a beautiful uh, flower shop and then pick up some flowers to his wife without having to seek any assistance from any sighted person? So that is a problem we are here to solve. Um, and as uh, Kara mentioned earlier, basically we connect uh, blind people with a network of remote trained agents and those agents essentially has a dashboard in front of a computer that will basically see what the blind person sees in real time and all the information that is coming onto the dashboard including the location sensors um, is all real time so that makes it much more efficient. Oh, one more thing, these agents are trained so that they exactly know how to communicate with the blind. Uh, you know, the classic example you know, Michael or somebody will appreciate this is, you know, you go to a mall and then uh, and a blind person asks a sighted person, hey, where do I get to CVS? And the classic answer you hear is the point and say, it's over there. So yeah. Yeah. people in here sighted people, I'm sure, <laughs> will appreciate that. So so, so the, the concept is, you know, that doesn't help. Um, if you had to give information to the blind person, put it in a perspective where it is much more appreciated than, you know, just pointing and say it's over there. So, yeah. Let me ask you uh, one or two follow-ups about how the uh, sort of how the service works. First question is: Do you have a bunch of people at this point who are wearing Google Glass and who are um, essentially sort of calling in and saying, "Okay, navigate me through this flower shop. I do want to buy flowers. Like, help me out here. Describe to me what I'm seeing, yeah. or I want to get around the mall. Whatever." Yeah. Um, and then the other question, uh, more frivolous question, is: Do do you ever hear back from people who say that they were in the flower shop and um, somebody thought it was hilarious that they were talking to the person in their um, in their glasses? I guess combination of both. It's just fun to hang out with blind people lately, <laughs> because I hear so many stories. I mean, I started with one friend. Now I have hundreds of friends in San Diego. The thing is, yes, we are a startup and we are uh, building this technology. Uh, rapid fast at the same time experimenting with hundreds of blind people localized in San Diego. The one reason is when we do the experimentation in the Lean Startup Principle whatsoever, you want that feedback uh, in time. You want that feedback uh, to go into the product development before it's too far and before we go out there and try to sell any product. 
So yeah, so we, we, we had done like hundreds of trials in San Diego. Uh, if you haven't heard us, which is not surprising because we are less focused on the marketing, more focused on the product right now. We are planning to launch later this year. I mean, I could have brought in some nice, cool clips that I could show um, uh, if I was talking more about uh, the service itself. But uh, there are people today, um, including uh, Michael Hinkson, who is in the room with us. Um, he's the blind man and also uh, 9-11 survivor at the, um, um, at the Towers incident. Uh, and we uh, also have like Eric Weyhenmeyer, who is the mountaineer. Uh, who is testing the service, as well as Christian Ha, the blind master chef. But these are the high-profile people, and the reason I say them is, that, you know, they they believe in this vision, which is pulling together the information, the comprehensive set solution, wherein, you know, you walk to your store, uh, you need to find a nearest grocery shop, not a problem. Yeah, sure, you can ask Siri, okay, where is the nearest grocery shop? And Siri will tell you, oh, you know what, one seems to be around 0.5 miles away. Then what? Yeah, sure, I have GPS, so I get the directions. So how do you use the GPS instructions to walk along the way? Yeah, sure, I open my uh, um, uh, Adrian GPS or other GPS apps, and then I walk to the store. Now then what? It's the last effing 50 feet. I guess most of our, <laughs> us in here appreciate the last effing 50 feet. And once you go, where, where do you find the door? And once you find the door, how do you find the exact set of flowers that you want? Um, and once you pick up the flowers, a uh, lot, lot of blind people, and I'm sure if anybody disagrees, let me know. Tell, you know what, someone, I don't want to never skip the line. Tell me the goddamn line, right? I want to stand in the line, I want to do the checkout like everybody does, and then I want to get out by myself with dignity. So, um, so you know, people have done wonderful things. Uh, they have done shopping, they have done... Uh, um, one, one lady, she has done... Uh, she has crossed an intersection by herself without... Uh, using any sighted assistance for the first time in her life, and that was like mind blowing. Um, and I, for, for myself, it was a learning experience because I didn't know how the technology will be used, and that's what was the learning process that Bilal was alluding to earlier. So anywhere from uh, shopping, you know, going to the grocery store, going to work in the morning, uh, at work, you have issues at work, you immediately call in, uh, traveling. Uh, I had to say, uh, a week ago or two weeks ago, um, Michael Hinkson actually broke the record because he used the service in the real airport. So he activated in the airport and he went all the way to the baggage claim with the assistance of an agent, finding the escalator without waiting for anybody and quicker than a normal otherwise procedure that they would go through. So it's all about um, efficiency um, and the real-time information. Finally, we've got uh, Eric Manser, who's an, an accessibility tester and consultant at IBM. So now we've sort of blown it up to really big tech um, and somebody who's inside and sees how a much bigger technology uh, company sort of deals with this segment of the market, is thinking about it, um, you know, or, you know, or prioritizes it. So. Eric, I want yeah, I, I'm interested in that perspective from inside a big technology company. Do you feel like this is something that's being talked about? Do you feel like it's something that most technologies think of as um, incidental? Um, well, I, w I wouldn't say incidental. Uh, it's definitely being talked about, which is an encouraging trend. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I am an accessibility tester and consultant at IBM. Uh, which means that for my day job, um, what I'm able to do is perform tests and you know provide guidance to inside teams at IBM uh, about ways to make um, you know current technology solutions uh, more accessible and some of the steps that can be followed and things like that. Uh, but I am uh, visually impaired myself. I, I am legally blind, uh, and so. What's exciting to me is that being at IBM, I actually have a front row seat to a lot of the technology that's emerging. Uh, a lot of the machine learning, cognitive computing, things like that, IBM Watson. Uh, and so while most of my you know, day job, so to speak, consulting revolves around existing and, and current state technologies, uh, I do have that front row seat to what's coming. And so as someone with a disability, it's very exciting uh, because, you know, the conversation is happening. And, uh, you know, you see a lot more kind of top-level CEO-level, you know, C-level executives that are paying attention. 
and recognizing the importance of uh, of accessible technology and solutions that really are inclusive by design and, and include everyone rather than you know necessarily saying a disabled population or any you know it's really these elegant solutions that include everyone from the design stage up uh, and so you know the fact that you see you know all these top tech companies like Facebook has been in the press a lot lately with with a lot of the stuff they're doing around accessibility Google uh, Microsoft, like all of these companies are just paying attention and recognizing the importance to the bottom line as well as, you know, just to a good customer experience and ensuring inclusion of everyone. What are the most exciting trends that you see coming that you think have the most potential? I mean, you mentioned Watson, who we've seen uh, win on Jeopardy. Yep. Um, he has, uh, uh, he, she, it, has um, uh, been deployed at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York to help with cancer diagnoses. Is there an application that you see uh, for Watson and for that kind of artificial intelligence really helping people who are visually impaired or blind? Absolutely. I mean, you know, Watson represents a lot of different things. Uh, you know, machine learning is huge. Uh, you know, the most exciting stuff to me is, and I think it was Bilal talking a little, a little bit about it, like, you know, almost like the surprise uh, <laughs> benefits, you know, like the unexpected benefits when something that is developed for everyone uh, has surprising benefits to, to a specific population, you know, in, in this case maybe the blind or visually impaired population, but, you know, something like Siri uh, or Echo may not have been developed specifically to the blind population, <coughs> but, you know, the amount or, or the degree to which it can make life easier is, is huge. Uh, same thing with like driverless cars. I mean, the, the fact that that technology is progressing, and you know, I mean, it's it's going going to be beneficial to society at large. But you know, as someone who had to give up driving ten years ago, or actually twelve years ago now, uh, you know, it, it was like giving up my independence. And so, you know, I feel like a drain on my wife, who cards our two daughters around, and plus me. You know, so it's like, you know, it's liberating to think that this technology that's emerging for everybody uh, has, you know, stands to change uh, and, and restore some of the independence I, you know, I feel like I may have lost with, with uh, vision loss. So, um, you know, same kind of thing, I, I think, with um, like the, and I, I'm stumbling for it, but uh, just, I mean, really anything that uh, is coming along that's being developed as a technology benefit for everyone that has a surprising side effect of, of helping the blind or visually impaired is very exciting. Well, I was talking to somebody who um, uh, knows a lot about iRobot uh, recently, which many of you know, they make those vacuum cleaners that can, they're autonomous and they'll just vacuum your room. They're sort of round and, and, and flat, real flat to the ground. And um, uh, she was saying that they're working very hard and their sort of big project right now is to get these vacuum cleaners to be able to map your entire house um, and to get the technology good enough because really you can't really vacuum a house well unless you really have good sensors and know like, oh, well, you left your wash basket in the middle of the floor in the living room. You're going to have to go around that. Because the problem with people's houses is they change all the time, right? People leave things in the middle of the floor, and, um, and you don't want the vacuum cleaner to be hitting those things all the time. So they're you know, getting really good. And of course, it's really it's only for the issue of convenience, right, so that they can vacuum people's floor well. But you can imagine that the exact mapping of a house, knowing that really well and how it changes on a day-to-day -day basis, you can imagine that if that data is stored in a nest or in an, you know, in an iRobot vacuum cleaner in your home, that's, that can be very useful information for somebody to have. Let's say who's visiting a home who hasn't been to that home before. Absolutely. And I mean, it, it makes me think of what Hugh was saying earlier in his keynote. I mean, the, the blurring of the lines of the so-called abled to the disabled, I mean, it's coming. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, the yeah. degree to which someone is obviously disabled is going away. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's about empowerment and, you know, it's MAPV's mission. I mean, with the proper supports, anything is possible and, and technology is a huge part of that, <laughs> those supports. So uh, it's exciting to watch.
I have one more question for the panel, but while I'm asking it, be thinking about questions that you may have. Um, and David will be coming with a mic, maybe. He'll do something. He'll shout your question, you know, whatever. But be thinking uh, about questions because this is a very engaged and knowledgeable audience. So uh, the questions you have are really important, and we want to hear them. Um, and the question I have actually comes sort of out of what you were saying, Eric, and I'll uh, address it to Bilal first, but I'm interested in what anybody has to say about it. You know, I, I talked at the beginning about 5.5 uh, million seniors who are blind or visually impaired right now going ballooning to 16 million. I mean, then that is just a huge shift. How much do you think the aging of the baby boomers factors into um, the way that Silicon Valley or, or New York or Boston or anybody doing startups, same way doing big tech companies, how much do you think that factors into uh, how they think about the products that they are creating? Um, and, and this obviously does, is not just the issue of sight, although that's a component. I mean, there's multiple things that happen as you age. But how much is that in people's minds? How's, how much is that in meetings? What do you think? Um, so people don't do as much population cohort analysis as you would think people would need to do, which is, you know, OK, I'm talking Silicon Valley, and I'm sure other investors and other people do it differently, but the, the common view in Silicon Valley is you build something that practically everybody should be able to use. And um, But here's the interesting thing that to notice. So Silicon Valley entrepreneurs typically tend to be younger. Um, but if you look at the trends over the last 10 years, you see something very interesting happen. You saw that the generation of Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook founder, you know, when they were young, when they were 17, 18, 19, they built companies that solved their problems of that time, which was basically dating, meeting women, you know. So they created <laughs> Facebook. They created Tinder, right? And then they became older and they became in their, you know, sort of, early 20s and, and whatnot, and it became they needed, they, their generation started to have a need to find careers and jobs. So you start seeing the rehashing of the new, I mean, young people don't use LinkedIn. There are tens of other new services that are more appropriate for younger people to find jobs, right? So they started creating j new job portals, new networking for business kind of relationships. Literally, I kid you not, my companies are recruiting on similar platforms than where you meet for dating. Right? So it's the same Tinder swipe left, swipe right, except that you're looking at somebody PhD in biotechnology swipe left, but in IT <laughs> swipe right. Um, and I've done that, and I've met people that way, because people just don't have the time patience. This population, these young people don't have the, the, the time to go through a two-page CV and resume to look at what you do. School. That sounds shockingly actually like the dating pool in Cambridge. The dating pool and the it totally PhD works. pool are almost it the totally same. It totally works, yeah. right? And also dating, the problem with dating is that once you meet somebody you like, you're not a customer anymore because you found somebody. So how do they keep engaging you? And then as they get older and they're starting to have kids, you're starting to see uh, that the same population now seeing a problem. So, you know, the new boom of technologies in, in Silicon Valley have to do with, you know, carpooling, nursing, finding caregivers. They're solving their problems, right? And in the same way, you're also seeing all these people who are in their 40s and 50s, they're like really worried about dying now. Right? So they're starting to invest in all kinds of human longevity solutions and cancer, giving out hundreds of millions of dollars into arcane diseases, because th this is going through their minds. Right. So th the reason I bring that up is that in Silicon Valley, what they're seeing is less so of, as they get excited about these smaller populations, it's less so because, you know, they did some analysis, 5.5 million people, and so much of, you know, economic benefit will come from it but more so that they personally experience this and they personally can see a viable path over the next five to 10 years to something that's game changing. And that's, you know, when I speak about our investment in IRA, right, with the lead investors in IRA, it wasn't based on, you know, how many blind people are out there. In fact, until I was coming to this conference, I had no clue how many blind people are out there uh, until I got that data sheet. But it was really built on really brilliant people that are doing this, what's called the convergence of technology, which is using a hardware software solution, combining it with artificial intelligence and national language, natural language processing, where you have to understand the voice, you have to understand what this image says and try to automate. And where you fail, you bring in a human being, which is the human in the loop AI, as it's being called. Convergence of all of that 
is is starting to create interesting solutions. One last thing I'd mention that doesn't get enough attention. In Silicon Valley, there are two things that happen at the macro scale over the last 10 years that have changed, I think, computing forever. One of them was the resurgence, for real reasons, of artificial intelligence and neural networks learning. This is a lot of buzzwords, but it's real. Uh, it is the ability to understand and act independently for computer systems to make, mimic and, and behave like human beings. And the second thing was the availability of open APIs, which is people used to build closed solutions. So if you wanted to build this solution, if in the previous generation he wanted to build a solution for Ira, he would have to build all the computing stack, he'll have to build the camera, because everything is closed, right? Everything was owned by IBM. So you had to work with IBM or there was no other way around. And that has changed. Even IBM has tons of APIs available that can now be used. So anybody could use the weather.com, which is now an IBM solution, to pull that data out and use. And connecting all of these APIs together, you can string together a solution on a shoestring budget and test it out with your customers like, like Ira is doing. And if you find utility, then money pours in. Hmm. Other thoughts on that? And while they're answering, if you do have questions, raise your hand and we'll make our way around to you. Oh, a lot of questions. Yeah, so what are all the buzzwords that he said are really powerful. <laughs> 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 they really come together very well when all the convergence happens. Um, Kara, I picked up on like a couple of things that I noted down. You know, you, you asked about 5 million to 15 million. Um, I mean, when, when we look at like our solution itself, yeah, yes, right now we use humans. And uh, as Bilan mentioned, humans are used because there are certain rudimentary skills that humans has that computers does not have today. And given uh, we are talking about the complexity in the world, it's not as simple as we see on the TV or on the videos where uh, everything is uh, automated. It's a journey. Um, and the journey involves humans. So existing artificial intelligence systems um, clarify is another uh, company who is building very cool neural network solution where it you know interprets the images very similar to microsoft oxford or google cloud vision there are a lot of number of different solutions out there but identifying what the image says is one thing and then identifying what information is useful to a person at a given time at a given place is another aspect of it and that's where human will play a huge role uh, and the scaling, right? So we are talking about 5 million to 15 million. Let's say if you are using humans for uh, uh, for our IRA service, and then we had to all of a sudden staff up maybe 3,000, 4,000, or 5,000 people. So scaling becomes really important unless and until you are thinking way ahead in advance what your scaling plan is and what your automation opportunities are, what things will go on uh, autopilot mode and what things will go to the human, and how we will get to a point where Everything is automated, so it's it's a trajectory, and uh, I just wanted to say, you know, scaling should be part of um, the plan, you know, when we build the technology. Eric, do you want? To? Sure. Um, just to add maybe a little uh, perspective too, like I recall very clearly, um, and I mean everything you guys have said is is. Uh, absolutely accurate uh, but I do have a specific experience that I that I'll share I'm compelled to share um, you know proud to say also as part of a, a MAVV affiliation I run uh, the Boston Marathon every year as part of the team with a vision and uh, as, as someone who is visually impaired that does that um, I'm happily networked with a number of blind and visually impaired runners, you know, athletes around the country and around the world. And there's a challenge that goes along with trying to be able to independently track your running performance. And the stopwatch that has existed that many of us have used for years uh, is very limiting. Uh, it's, it's almost like a plastic toy. Uh, it's not water proof or water resistant if you go, if you run in drizzle uh, it dies on you and so a few of my you know cohorts and I uh, some years ago uh, made an attempt to try and get more of a robust running solution you know that we could use and know where we were in terms of time and pace and you know where we were on a run and uh, and get feedback and, and know exactly how we were doing and so um, 
we approached a manufacturer at that time and said, you know, we're blind runners and, you know, we need a better solution. And it was very clear that it, it was falling on deaf ears. Like there was no interest. I mean, it was such a small niche market. It was perceived as this, you know, this uh, non-addressable group. Uh, but, it, you know, fast forward a few years and you see that, you know, if you focus just on disability as a, as a niche, uh, then you're missing the point because disability is all of us, right? I mean, dis at some point in our lives, everyone is going to experience some level of disability. So if you focus just on blind or visually impaired, or you spoke, focus on some people with hearing loss and, and that kind of thing, but everyone, you know, so, I mean, it really broadens the market into the, the question that you asked earlier, Kara, like, you know, I think companies are really recognizing that now. Like, it's it's everybody. It, it impacts us all. And so, you know, I think that it's uh, it's resulting in these very exciting solutions that, that are addressing the, the broader population. So it's exciting to see again.